Uh, good, good morning, uh, everyone. It's um, Friday morning, and uh, welcome to the Virtual Thyroid Journal Club. Uh, we have, as many of you know, changed our format to a webinar uh, to accommodate more individuals and also to give us some additional functionality. Before we get started, just one quick note, and that is that um, slightly different than our previous format, um, but still uh, um, uh, uh, gives us the capability of asking questions. All you need to do is click on the chat tab and ask, uh, write in your questions. And from there, um, I'll be able to get to these a little bit later in the program. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Catherine Sinclair. Um, who is an esteemed colleague at uh, Mount Sinai, um, an internationally um, renowned expert in thyroid and parathyroid, uh, who's gonna be presenting a particular article. And then uh, once she's completed that, I'll, um, I will uh, come back in and give some additional perspectives as it relates to this, um, to this article and the topic. Catherine, thanks. Thanks, Dr. Erkin. I just wanted to actually thank Dr. Erkin and the Thank Foundation for inviting me to present this article today. Hopefully, it will uh, provide for some interesting discussion. Um, I'm just going to go through the slides and through the article itself. But before we start, we thought it would be interesting to do a poll just to assess how people currently would manage a certain clinical scenario. And uh, so we'll go through that. We'll go through that question now, and then at the end, Dr. Erkin will uh, will repeat this poll, and we'll see if anyone's changed their mind based on what's been presented. So, the case is a 45-year-old female who presents with code recurrence in the right lateral neck five years following initial right thyroid lobectomy and ipsilateral level six lymph node dissection. She has good health otherwise, and her initial pathology revealed a 2.8 centimeter conventional papillary thyroid carcinoma with two positive nodes from the ipsilateral central compartment. No radioactive iodine was given and current ultrasound reveals ipsilateral right level three 2.4 centimeter cystic lymph node, which is positive for malignancy on cytology, a suspicious right level four lymph node measuring on ultrasound approximately four millimeters in diameter and no evidence of nodules in the contralateral left lobe with no suspicious central compartment nodes. Um, which of the following options would you advise for this recurrent disease? And I think we're going to give you a screen to select one of the uh, one of the options. Actually, let me just let me just quickly before that poll runs up, let me just run through those options. A right lateral selective neck dissection, completion thyroid level six dissection on the left and remnant ablation, option A. Option B, a right lateral selective neck dissection, completion thyroid, uh, central compartment dissection on the left and then wait on radioactive iodine until you obtain a follow-up thyroglobulin at six weeks after surgery. Uh, that's option B. Option C, a right lateral selective neck dissection and option D, active surveillance on the lymph nodes and no further therapy decision for four to six months. So I'll ask everyone online if you can select one of those options, A, B, C or D um, on the poll. And I'll give you just a minute to do that. Okay, hopefully everyone's had time to select one of those options. I can't actually see how many people have responded, so I'm hoping that's enough time for you all to select. And, oh, there we go. There we go. So the majority of people would do the uh, right lateral next um, dissection, this, the completion thyroidectomy, the left central neck dissection, and then wait um, for four to six weeks before deciding on the radioactive iodine um, to obtain the thyroglobulin level. Okay, good. So let's let's move on and uh, and speak a little bit about uh, about this article. Um, just before I get started going through the article, I wanted to just touch on uh, the reasons behind 
why we would consider doing a lobectomy for thyroid cancer when traditionally we've done total thyroidectomies basically for uh, all thyroid cancers and it's been in the last few years that we've drastically changed our management. So in 2015, based on a uh, number of studies that were done preceding this, the American Thyroid Association included in their guidelines that lobectomy may be appropriate for select patients with thyroid cancer under four centimetres in size without other adverse features. Um, some of the studies that were used to come up with that recommendation um, included three very large um, population database studies based on the National Cancer Database and the SEER database, which basically showed no significant survival differences between lobectomy and total thyroidectomy for select patients with um, thyroid cancers, generally under four centimetres, although um, two studies did include um, thyroid cancers over four centimetres. And I, this last trial, the one by Matt Suzu, I put in because this is the same group who published the article we'll be discussing today. And their study was uh, also fairly impressive just because they had a, you know, retrospectively reviewed a decent number of charts and also found that the survival between, um, actually they didn't compare total thyroidectomy to hemithyroidectomy, they just looked at patients who'd had lobectomy for thyroid cancer and found that the cause specific survival was excellent, but that age over 45 years, size greater than four centimetres and the presence of lymph node metastases and extra thyroid extension definitely uh, had worse outcomes. And so their recommendation was basically similar to what was then uh, taken up in the ATA guidelines that uh, patients with select thyroid cancers without adverse features may be appropriate for lobectomy. So why would we consider doing lobectomy for a patient instead of a total thyroidectomy? Um, we've looked at you know, the clinical outcomes being similar. Um, we, as uh, time progresses, we are sort of in, heading into this de-escalation phase where not only are we actively just observing some microcarcinomas, we're also uh, trying not to give everyone radioactive iodine and if we are giving it, trying to give it at lower doses. And so we have a reduced reliance on radioactive iodine for low to intermediate risk patients, which means that taking the whole thyroid is not necessary in all patients, uh, given that one of the uh, main reasons for doing that is so that we can administer post-operative uh, iodine. And diagnostic whole body scan is now Real, well, less less utilised for um, follow-up, definitely rarely utilised in those low-risk patients. And so again, we're not reliant on having no thyroid tissue in the neck um, for our follow-up. We're much more reliant on our lab tests and our ultrasounds. Um, so that brings us to the paper today, which I think uh, all, you know, is, is interesting because it sort of takes that and pushes those boundaries one step further. Um, and this, uh, this article came out of, uh, from our colleagues in Japan and basically is looking at the impact of completion thyroidectomy followed by radioactive iodine for patients with lymph node recurrence after patients had initially undergone a lobectomy for thyroid cancer. Uh, so let's have a look at the article and then Dr. Erkin is going to uh, lead a, a discussion um, about this topic. So, so basically the premise for the article was that you know, in this age of de-escalation therapies um, and adoption, where we're all, you know, many of us are adopting lobectomy as an adequate treatment for some people with thyroid cancer, um, there's really no standardised management algorithm for those patients that then recur after their surgery. And so the main objective of this study was to compare the effectiveness of lymphadenectomy alone, so just removing those involved lymph nodes, not touching the contralateral thyroid, compared to the more standardised treatment of completing the thyroidectomy, removing the lymph nodes, and then giving post-operative radioactive iodine. So the methods, um, the, the methods, it was a retrospective chart review, which obviously has its own limitations and, and biases associated with it. Uh, the sample size was not huge. There were 125 patients included, but the median follow-up was pretty good. It was 10.2 years. And actually, if you, uh, when, you, when, you, when you look at the article, the median time from the person's initial surgery to the time of lymph node recurrence was five years. So that median follow-up was after their second surgery or second uh, treatment. 
So actually the median follow-up was more like 15 years from their initial surgery, which is, you know, I think we'd all agree is a reasonable uh, follow-up period. And this, uh, this study took place over a six-year time period. They reviewed charts uh, for over a six-year time period. And this was before the 2015 ATA guidelines and definitely before the eighth edition of the AJCC um, staging guidelines. So the, this uh, indications uh, for treatment were slightly different in, in that time period. And, you know, definitely, I think most of us were not performing lobectomy for thyroid cancer at that time. So it's impressive that, uh, that they took that step, you know, that early on. Uh, so let's look, let's have a little look at uh, the inclusion and exclusion criteria. They had 672 patients within this six year time frame who had recurrence of their thyroid cancer in lymph nodes in the neck. Um, but of that 672 patients, about you know, a third of patients were having a second or more recurrence. And those patients were excluded uh, because the idea of this study was to look at first recurrence in lymph nodes following lobectomy. So that left about 400 patients with a first recurrence. Uh, distant metastasis um, and recurrent surgery, they were excluded because again, we're trying to look at outcomes with the localized disease, um, leaving 339 patients with no uh, distant metastasis. And then because the aim of the study was to look at patients who'd undergone lobectomy, uh, patients who initially underwent near total or total thyroidectomy were again excluded and that took a sort of another third of the group away. So that left 244 patients, which was about a third of the initial 672 patients who actually had residual thyroid tissue in the neck, i.e. they'd undergone a lobectomy or similar for removal of their initial thyroid cancer. Um, if there was thyroid cancer detected in that residual thyroid, so if the contralateral load had thyroid cancer on it that was visible on ultrasound, confirmed on biopsy, those patients were excluded because, again, just going back to the objective of the study, it was to look at patients who basically had normal contralateral thyroid but just had isolated lymph node recurrences. So that, again, took away another third of the study population. And then a few patients just had residual thyroid cancer within their contralateral lobe um, without lymph node metastases, and again, they were excluded. So that left about 145 patients who had lymph node metastases without residual thyroid cancer. Uh, some patients, you know, went on the study and had their surgery, had the completion thyroidectomy, the lymph nodes removed, but then elected not to have the radioactive iodine. And it seems from the article, seems that most of those patients had concerns about the radioactive iodine efficiency or side effects. And also a number of them were pregnant and did not want to have it for that reason. So because they not, didn't follow through with the treatment protocol, um, they were also excluded. And so that left our 125 patients who were included. These were the patients, again, with nodal metastases without thyroid cancer in the contralateral thyroid lobe, um, who had undergone a lobectomy at some stage in the past. So the patients were apparently informed of both study treatments um, and then a recommendation by the surgeon was made based on the patient's pathology, um, degree of disease, et cetera. They don't really go into detail about how that recommendation was made, but the patients uh, did have, you know, a discussion with the surgeon and then the surgeon seems to have made the recommendation as to what treatment would be best. Um, again, if they refused part of the treatment in the uh, lymphadenectomy completion thyroid um, and radiation group, the LCR group, um, then they were just put into the lymphadenectomy group. Um, and then if uh, the, 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 it's a little vague about what surgery exactly was performed for these lymph node recurrences. So um, to quote the article, if nodal recurrence occurred in the nodal dissection area of initial surgery, and I'm going to come back to this because it's probably the way this, uh, these patients were managed initially may be a little different to how some of us manage our patients um, with lobectomy, but basically all patients who had a lobectomy, or pretty much all of them, had a central neck dissection at the time of their lobectomy, regardless of their being macroscopic or um, you know, preoperatively uh, pre detected nodes in that area. So all patients underwent a nodal dissection. So if the nodal recurrence occurred in that ipsilateral central neck, 
um, the it was sort of it sounded more like there was a sort of berry picking procedure done where the, the any extra involved lymph nodes were then removed um, and then if recurrence was in the non-dissected region so the contralateral central neck or the lateral neck then a regional lymph node dissection was performed no more specifics about you know whether what levels were involved or what sort of so that is one vague area of the article but we have to assume that they removed surrounding lymph nodes as well as the uh, as the involved ones um, so the patients and this is this is the important one you know one of the important points in this article the patients who chose completion thyroidectomy all of them underwent a central neck dissection so all patients in that LCR group who underwent the completion thyroid as well as the nodal removal and the radioiodine underwent a central neck dissection of that remnant um, lobe side, so the contralateral side to the initial disease, along with the completion thyroidectomy. Um, and then the dose of iodine was a low dose in the LCR group. Uh, they received 30 um, millicuries of the um, radioactive iodine. And then fairly standard follow-up protocols um, with ultrasound and thyroglobulins um, over, a, as we've spoken about, over a fairly long um, time frame. All right, let's move down. So the, um, the outcomes were um, surgical outcomes, looking at rates of complications in the two groups, um, particularly permanent hyperparathyroidism at 12 months post-surgery. They didn't extend the follow-up of the hyperparathyroidism past that time, but this is a fairly pertinent one because it was a significant difference between the groups. Um, distant relapse-free survival, lymph node relapse-free survival, overall survival, and then the treatment cost, but just extended out to one year post the recurrent surgery, again, not extending past that time. Time frame. So um, in this is table two in the article. I have put it in first because this is actually the characteristics of the patients at their initial surgery. So this is before they recurred. This is at the time of their initial lobectomy. Um, and I thought this was a good one to look at first before we look at the characteristics of the patients when they recurred. Um, so I think the notable things, I put a couple of little boxes in, although these, um, these differences didn't reach statistical significance, uh, it is important to note that in the LCR group, the age distribution was much younger. Um, they noted in the article that this was possibly because the physician didn't want to give radioactive iodine to older patients. I found it interesting because I think, you know, and people can comment, you know, later, but sometimes we think that you know, older patients do worse if they have higher stage disease and definitely when the staging system, uh, when this trial, the patients in this trial were done, the older staging system was used where having lymph node lateral neck disease would have upstaged patients who are over 45 to you know, a stage four um, uh, level. So you would think that most of those older patients would have got radioactive iodine, but um, you know, so I, I'm not sure about the argument that um, the physician didn't want to give iodine to older patients, but that maybe uh, was valid. Uh, and so, but the, uh, and then when, but when you reclassify it um, using, and they reclassified this using the AJCC A physician, um, that sort of using the age 55 as a cutoff, even though when the data was collected, they were still in the age 45 cutoffs, um, it sort of uh, flattened out and it wasn't statistically significant in terms of differences in age. Um, lymph node dissection as well. Uh, again, I'd already brought up that pretty much everyone having completion thyroidectomies, um, well, put, sorry, everyone having lobectomies uh, have a central neck dissection as part of the uh, of the treatment. And you can see here that at the initial surgery, um, that held true. Pretty much all patients underwent an ipsilateral central neck dissection. Um, and the breakdown of thyroid cancers, um, pretty much as expected, more microcarcinomas in the LCR group, um, although not statistically significant, um, and then a couple of uh, sort of outlying uh, types as well at the initial surgery. So now we're going to skip back to table one in the article. These are the characteristics of the patients at the time of their first recurrence, their first lymph node recurrence. And again, we can see a difference in the age distribution, um, which was statistically significant with uh, significantly younger people in the LCR group. Um, and then the the other, you know, the other thing to look at is the number of preoperatively diagnosed metastatic lymph nodes fairly similar between groups. So two was the median 
number of preoperatively diagnosed uh, of diagnosed lymph nodes. And then in terms of the size of the lymph nodes, again, reasonably even distribution in terms of the size of that preoperatively diagnosed lymph node recurrence. I want to just draw everyone's attention down to the thyroglobulin levels um, preoperatively. And I think this, although this didn't reach statistical significance, it is important to note that in the LCR group, the more aggressively treated group, the baseline thyroglobulin levels at the time of that first recurrence were higher, suggesting a higher burden of disease, um, despite the fact that the preoperatively, you know, preoperatively diagnosed number of lymph nodes was similar in each group. And so I think that is important because it potentially does add some bias into this, uh, into this analysis, given that people with a higher burden of disease may be expected to uh, re, you know, have a higher chance of, of recurring again down the track. So I just want to draw attention uh, to, to that point. All right, so let's, uh, let's now look at the patients after they've had that surgery for their uh, lymph node recurrence. And what we can see here, many more lymph nodes were harvested in the LCR group than in the lymphadenectomy alone group. And again, the uh, authors made the note that this was perhaps because the uh, central, a central neck dissection was performed, a contralateral central neck dissection was performed in the LCR group routinely when the contralateral thyroid lobe was removed. Uh, but it also uh, makes you wonder whether the burden of disease, given the highest thyroglobulins, baseline thyroglobulins in this group, whether the burden of disease was actually a lot more also in this group. And there's no real mention of that in the article. So it's hard to figure out which was the, uh, which was the, uh, the case, but definitely that reached uh, statistical significance. And then the other thing to note, of course, as expected really, is that the rates of hypoparathyroidism, both, tra you know, both transient and permanent, were much higher in the LCR group. And that's not surprising given every patient at their initial lobectomy had a central neck dissection, which you know, potentially you know, has disrupted the parathyroids on that side. And then the patients in the LCR group had a contralateral central neck dissection, regardless of disease burden on the contralateral side. So not surprising that there are, you know, reasonably high rates uh, of permanent hyperparathyroidism in that group. And similarly, um, recurrent laryngeal nerve paralysis occurring after the recurrent surgery, rates very low, um, but going back, uh, and I didn't draw attention to it in the previous table, might just pop back up, the uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve uh, paralysis rate before the recurrent surgery, so after lobectomy surgery, reasonably high rates actually, you know, 18%, 15% um, of patients. So again, makes you a little nervous about going in and, and removing that contralateral lobe if you've got a nerve palsy on the other side. And I think uh, it's uh, the data presented in this article will make us all think about those patients who do have nerve palsies, whether going into the other side and potentially putting that other nerve at risk is, is the right thing to do. So, all right, let's uh, move on to some of these um, survival and outcome graphs. So basically in the top left hand of your screen is the overall survival um, graph. Very, very good overall survival in both groups. Um, you know, there may be some bias in the LCR group because they're younger patients, um, but it, it really didn't bear out in the overall survival. Um, so then looking at the distant relapse-free survival, which is the graph in the upper right, again, no statistically significant difference um, between the distant relapse-free survival in the two groups, although, you know, there's maybe some difference at when you, once you get over 10 years, but still not statistically significant. Um, the lymph node relapse-free survival, though, in the LCR group, although it didn't reach statistical significance, there is um, a drop off in that lymph node relapse free survival in the later part of the follow up period in the LCR group. And, you know, I, I don't think it's necessary, you know, I think this is where some of the bias comes in because we have to remember that that group did have higher baseline thyroglobulins to begin with. Uh, they had more lymph nodes resected at the time of their surgery. Now, whether that was just because a central neck dissection was performed routinely on all those patients, or, and I think perhaps more likely, there was a higher disease burden. Um, I think uh, this 
uh, this is, you know, an important an important thing to know. And I just want to go back again um, to table three, this ratio of metastatic lymph nodes to total harvested. The, uh, the ratio itself was very similar between, uh, between the groups, but for the ratio, given the LCR group had a much higher number of lymph nodes removed, for the ratio to be similar, they also had a higher absolute burden of, 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 metastatic, of metastatic lymph nodes. So, uh, so overall, they, you know, it reflects what the thyroglobulin had suggested at the beginning, that they did have more involved lymph nodes, and that is perhaps why we're seeing um, some, uh, some drop in lymph node uh, relapse-free survival in that group, although, again, not reaching statistical significance. So in summary, you know, the strength of this, of this article really is that it makes us think. It makes us think about what we would consider standard treatment for patients with lymph node recurrence, and it makes us think, could we do less? Similar to the way, you know, the active surveillance articles have done that, definitely a number of the radioactive iodine um, trials, you know, have made us think about avoidance or dose reduction. And I think this um, looks at a new group of patients, but a group of patients that's going to become larger and larger in upcoming years as we perform more and more lobectomies for thyroid cancer. And so it really broadens the horizon um, for potential de-escalation treatments. And it has the potential for a significant change in patient management compared to what we do at the moment. Um, one of the strengths is that they had a, a good follow-up time, you know, a follow-up of 15 years. I commend the authors on the fact that they were doing, uh, you know, doing lobectomies in the uh, early 2000s when, uh, when uh, you know, it really was not an established treatment. And so I, I think that's a, a really big strength of this article. Obviously, the limitations, the retrospective nature um, of the article has inherent biases that cannot be avoided. And definitely in the LCR group, very small sample size, you know, less than 30 patients. And there were those intergroup disparities that we spoke about. You know, the ages were different, the burden of disease was likely different, and that definitely adds some confounding factors. I think the article is very vague on the types of nodal dissections that were actually done, and the lymph node yields. If uh, if you know if the uh, if lateral neck dissections were being done in a percentage of patients, you know, lymph node yields were probably lower than many of us would get in a lateral neck dissection. So um, it's hard to know exactly what degree of neck dissection was done for those patients, which may have affected then, um, you know, their lymph node uh, recurrence rates. And the uh, adoption of universal central nodal dissection without any clinical disease in all these patients definitely increased the rates of hypoparathyroidism. Um, and maybe um, maybe unnecessarily elevated those rates. And so perhaps the hypoparathyroidism outcome um, is to be taken a little bit with a grain of salt because it's probably, uh, we would maybe be a little more cautious about uh, putting patients through the same degree of treatment um, in terms of central neck and, and uh, increasing their rates so much by doing that for uh, for what is effectively a node negative neck. Um, and then the applicability of the cost analysis, obviously the cost analysis that they did was only for a year of follow-up. There probably would have been more significance actually between the groups if they'd extended that time frame past a year because then they would have had to take into account the treatment costs of ongoing hyperparathyroidism for the rest of your life and et cetera, et cetera. So, um, but the applicability, obviously when it's done in one country, it's difficult to apply to another country. Um, and so that would be, you know, they would be some of the limitations of this article. But I think um, I'll be very interested to hear Dr. Erkin's discussion. And I think this is, uh, this really does uh, raise the question of whether we are doing too much for these patients and whether we could do less. Thank you, Catherine. That was uh, terrific. Um, what I'd like to do is just uh, pull up my slides here. Um, and hopefully, uh, hopefully you all can see that. Um, so I think uh, Catherine's given a, a terrific overview of what um, uh, of the um, uh, of this particular article. And um, oh gosh, let me just go back. And so I think one of the important things about this article relates to the institution and the Ito Hospital. 
um, for your reference, is a thyroid-only hospital, uh, which is quite remarkable. And the statistics for that institution are equally remarkable, and it reflects the fact that um, they hold a particular prominence within Japanese society. And you can see the number of ultrasounds performed on an annual basis exceeding um, up to uh, 120,000. And um, at this point, I believe there are over 2,000 surgical procedures per year, um, which is um, uh, also equally uh, remarkable. And as Catherine alluded to, um, what the trends in differentiated thyroid cancer management have really um, altered over time. And so that's uh, um, referenced here in terms of the extent of thyroidectomy, the management of clinically non-evident lymph nodes, the role of remnant ablation, the role of TSH suppression, um, and now in this de-escalation mode um, are um, uh, looking at um, the treatment of recurrent persistent uh, nodal disease. And so um, the question is, is, is the decision to treat um, a binary one? And at first blush, when looking at this question, what do you do for recurrent persistent lymph nodes? The initial reaction, I think, for most of us would be that more is better, and it's obvious. And so I suspect that the majority of people would opt, although I was interested in the poll that we took, that it was more evenly distributed than what I would have otherwise thought. Um, but the reality is that there's really not good evidence to support our zeal to do more. Um, and the question then becomes, is a more measured approach justified? And so this binary approach is really has to be tempered as our poll and the particular case that we presented would suggest that active surveillance is an option. Lymph node dissection without necessarily giving an um, automatic remnant ablation and uh, relying on a post-op TG to help to determine that, and possibly a different level of um, uh, radioactive iodine could also be and should be uh, considered. Um, but is there a role for ethanol ablation for metastatic nodes that has come into vogue in some centers? And perhaps even further, would further evaluation with either a radioactive iodine or PET scan or both have helped to inform the decision about how um, how effective rate remnant ablation would have been um, as it, and therefore would have helped to inform the decision as to whether a completion thyroidectomy um, could have value. And so one of the things, this is labeled as recurrent disease within this article, but the reality is that um, and as with most lymph node um, recurrences or persistence, there really are more likely persistent disease. And that is due to an inadequacy of initial pre-op lymph node assessment. Um, and the other factor or variable is suboptimal lymph node clearance in a dissected compartment. Um, and so both of those um, challenge the idea that this is really truly recurrent disease. Um, and challenge the concept that, um, that the new appearance of this nodal disease or the emergence of this nodal disease represents a more aggressive phenotype or just a failure of initial therapy. And so trying to determine how relevant this is as it relates to practice of thyroid care in the United States, um, raises the question about how many of these patients would have on, undergone a completion thyroidectomy at the time of the initial surgery or soon thereafter as the final pathology um, informs us about the biology of that tumor. How many would have been treated with remnant ablation initially? Would thyroglobulin monitoring have been helpful in the overall management of these patients? And one of the things that the article fell short on is um, information, and it may have been related to the time era in which um, they were uh, these these patients were being treated. But um, in terms of the presence of adverse histologic features, in terms of E&E and the size of the nodes, some of the things that we're using at this time to stratify nodal um, nodal involvement. And then the question, would more intensive therapy have changed the outcome of these patients with respect to local regional recurrence? and distant disease. All of these are unanswered questions. 
And I, I come back to this one particular table that um, Catherine had alluded to in terms of looking at whether or not in the current paradigm that we use, that the majority of us use, whether or not that would have triggered a need for more intensive therapy at the initial operation. And uh, the presence of gross extra, extra thyroidal extension, um, the number of metastatic nodes with a median of five um, up to as many as 13 or um, 18 in the two groups, certainly likely would have triggered um, uh, us to have recommended a completion thyroidectomy in the early course of uh, these patients' um, treatment. But it's important, as Catherine had noted, that 22 of the patients did have RLM paralysis and certainly would have tempered the enthusiasm for going in and doing a completion thyroidectomy and pursuing remnant ablation um, on a more aggressive treatment path in that subset of patients. Is there any, any help from the American Thyroid Association clinical practice guidelines as it relates to the management of this subset of patients? And there's really not. Um, what the, the extent to which recurrent lymph nodes are um, discussed in the ATA 2015 guidelines really tells us that surgery is the mainstay of therapy, that um, the, the, th the size thresholds for um, lymph nodes to recommend treatment is eight millimeters or more in the central and 10 or more in the lateral compartments. Um, and the question is um, whether to watch or intervene. And there are a number of biologic factors as it relates to the particulars of that, partic of that patient, some additional information that um, could help to inform that decision as to whether one should intervene when those nodes are first noted, and also um, very important patient-related variables that could impact the decision to intervene or to take a more conservative course. And there's really not much um, in the ATA guidelines with respect to the role of repeat um, radioactive iodine um, in, this sub, in this population and certainly in those patients who undergo less than total thyroidectomy. And um, as it relates to the radioactive iodine, um, I, in the population who do undergo surgery for recurrent nodal disease, all that it, uh, the ATA guidelines um, address is the role of radioactive iodine if there is residual RAI avid disease. Um, uh, present or suspected, and acknowledge the fact that there are no randomized controlled clinical trials demonstrating better patient outcomes after um, radioactive iodine in this population of patients. And just taking a quick look at the British Society guidelines in 2014, they um, also come up with um, vagary as it relates to the degree to which we should be aggressive in the management in terms of multimodalities. Um, treatment of recurrent lymph nodes. One of the things that struck me was a bit of a leap of faith from a pragmatic perspective. Um, in the upper left, you can see what the extent of the initial surgery was in this population of patients. But if you go to the lower right, certainly re-entry into the previously dissected central compartment represents um, a, um, something that we're all familiar with. But going into the contralateral side and doing a lymph node dissection without removing the lobe um, represents um, somewhat of a pragmatic concern. Certainly, um, in order to do that effectively, you have to dissect out the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And some of those patients, a small subset, did incur additional um, nerve uh, injury, although it appeared to be temporary. Um, but if you're going into that compartment, conventional surgical wisdom would have suggested that um, you should go ahead and clear that, depart, that compartment so as to avoid having to uh, go back in at a later date should there be a problem, although the authors do um, provide some insight as to why they chose not to, and it relates to the risk of um, injury to the superior parathyroid as well as um, a more complete dissection of the um, um, of the recurrent laryngeal nerve higher up to the posterior ligament. So um, let's, let me just go up to 10,000 feet and just talk about 
these three questions as it relates to de-escalation. And let me just give you a little bit of background. The, what is the role of TS, um, TSH suppression in, um, in low-risk thyroid cancer? And um, this is an article that, um, and a study that was done that really, that was alluded to in um, the article that uh, Catherine reviewed. And it really is um, an interesting article that uh, was published back in 2010. The conclusion of which that is that thyroid conserving surgery without TSH suppression should be considered in patients with low risk um, uh, thyroid cancer. And these are the, the um, outcomes. And uh, this study looked at both low and high risk patients with low risk patients showing no um, significant improvement in, the out in outcome as a result of TSH suppression. However, the high risk um, patients, as you can see in the lower right, did show improvement um, in disease-free survival as a result of um, TSH suppression. And so they concluded that there was equivalency of not performing TSH suppression in the low risk group of patients um, and concern that um, in folks who do have a very favorable outcome um, with a very low, low risk of cause of cancer specific deaths that doing less um, is rather than over treatment represents a favorable strategy. And um, Catherine already looked at the role of conservative management um, and she did mention this and I, I, I'm gonna skip through this very quickly, but this is also from the same institution and the numbers as are in this um, that these uh, that these authors did uh, report were really very convincing. Um, it as it relates to doing a thyroid lobectomy and as it relates to um, uh, remnant thyroid recurrence, which you can see out for 25 years was extremely low. Lymph node recurrence was a little bit higher, and um, there were variables um, with thyroid. Uh, um, the size of the th primary tumor being greater than 40 millimeters, extra thyroidal extension, and clinical lymph node metastases indicating um, that uh, this that there was a higher risk of lymph node recurrence. Distance uh, recurrence free survival was um, really quite excellent. Again, the same variables um, of greater than four centimeters, ETE and clinical lymph nodes. Um, had an impact on distant recurrence and cause-specific survival um, was also extremely favorable with uh, just two variables having an impact um, on multivariate analysis, namely four centimeter size, great, greater than four centimeters and extra thyroidal extension. And so finally, the last question is the role of remnant ablation. And there really were two articles that um, uh, were worth looking at as it relates to specifically the role of um, giving additional radioactive iodine in the population of patients who have recurrent lymph nodes. And this article by Yim is widely quoted. It's a little bit of a complex article to go through. Um, and uh, the, the treatment paradigm is demonstrated um, in the, um, on this slide with um, patients who go through um, treatment and um, are broken down into two different groups and the numbers are small um, but still informative but it is important to note that there was um, that all of these treatments all these patients treated in this particular study did undergo total thyroidectomy and remnant ablation initially that's certainly very different than our the cohort in the in the particular uh, paper that we're reviewing today, um, where none of the patients um, uh, underwent that aggressive initial treatment. Um, but the conclusions um, indicate that in patients who still have elevated stimulated TG after reoperation for locally recurrent persistent PTC, adjuvant radioactive iodine therapy compared with no ad, um, additional RAI, th RAI therapy resulted in no significant differences. And that's borne out in um, this follow-up slide, looking at the percentage of second clinical recurrence. Um, and here you can see that radioactive iodine 
had no apparent efficacy in reducing recurrence rates after surgery for recurrent nodal disease. Um, and again, this is in a group of patients who had um, undergone more aggressive initial treatment. Um, and uh, so the question, we can talk about this in just a moment, as to whether or not we can actually derive um, a similar conclusion um, for the particular question of patients who undergo more limited treatment um, for low-risk cancer um, in, uh, as part of their initial treatment paradigm. And so finally, the last study worth looking at is this Italian study um, in which the, the question of who benefits from radioactive iodine in patients who have recurrent lymph nodes. And to, um, in the interest of time, just looking at this, um, these, this is a study that was conducted um, on intermediate to high risk um, uh, patients in whom all patients who develop recurrence had lateral node dissections um, and uh, roughly two thirds um, had radioactive iodine and, 40, and a third or a little bit more than a third had um, no radioactive iodine with almost six year follow up. And the conclusions were that um, patients that were in the older age group, over 65 years, have higher risk of disease pro um, progression and appeared to benefit from radioactive iodine as it relates to progression-free survival. Um, but interestingly, patients with a suppressed TG greater than one and treated with radioactive iodine, that cohort, in addition to age, had improved progression-free survival and overall survival. Um, uh, um, as opposed to patients who had a stimulated TG less than one who showed no benefit from radioactive iodine. Some of the variables that I mentioned uh, uh, are that in these two studies, patients underwent more aggressive initial therapy with both total thyroidectomy and remnant ablation and then developed recurrent nodal disease. And so the question being is, were resistant nodes being selected for and thereby reducing the efficacy of further radioactive iodine? Um, and is it different? Are we dealing with a different population of low-risk patients who undergo only lobectomy and no remnant ablation? Um, and uh, unfortunately, there are no con randomized control studies from which to draw um, conclusions. And so we come to the end here and say, um, as we move towards de-escalation therapy, you know, all of us are left with some degrees of knowledge gaps as it results, as it relates to some of these lingering questions. And should low risk thyroid cancer who are found to have positive nodes on initial lobectomy, do we automatically com um, commit those patients to a completion thyroidectomy at the time of that initial treatment or when we have their final pathology report that? And I, I, don't, I don't know that we have an answer to that we have some information from the pathology as it relates to the nature of those nodes um, and certain histologic features as it relates to E&E &E that will inform us. Um, but we have to question, if you look at, the, um, at some of the Japanese literature in which their threshold for performing a completion thyroidectomy is significantly less, we have to question whether our current lymph node stratification where we have um, and the number of five uh, metastatic nodes and the size of nodes, whether or not that um, is a risk stratification um, that is correct. Does the uninvolved lymph um, thyroid lobe have to be removed when recurrent nodes are, are um, identified? Um, and I think this study uh, draws that into question and certainly the role of radioactive iodine. And so I come back to our case that we presented in the hopes that we can again ask um, whether or not we've changed any views. I was interested to see um, that there was a fairly good smattering of responses across the um, various treatment options. Um, and so from that point of view, um, I think if we could put up the poll and see if anybody has um, uh, has altered their view and whether our distribution of responses has changed here.
Okay. Um, I think we'll give people a, a second to respond. And I think what I'd like to do is just come back to Catherine um, and just see if she has um, uh, any questions. There's one question that has come up. If we could just show the results on our poll here. Um, and it looks like uh, that we actually have swayed some opinion here considerably um, in the way that this has, uh, that your responses and they're shown here. Um, I just want to get to one of the questions, and that is that doesn't this study just demonstrate that patients with worse, with more burdensome disease do worse and radioactive iodine um, effect across both groups is probably not large. And so let me just see if, um, Catherine, do you, let me give you a chance to um, give some further uh, comments here. Is Catherine still on? Can you can you hear me? I, I can't get uh, back. On. Yes, can you I've got you. Yeah. Thank you. No, I think this I think this study does draw into question the role of radioactive iodine uh, in this group of patients. Full stop, because it was a very low dose use and there was no significant difference. Um, but I think. Uh, the other, you know, the the other thing, it definitely makes me think about, you know, we get a lot, a lot of young patients with small cancers who have maybe one lateral neck node who really would love to not have their whole thyroid out and avoid needing to have full thyroid hormone supplementation, which, as we know, there's more and more literature coming out to suggest some people do not tolerate that as well as perhaps we have, have told them they will in the past. You know, the question, and I think Dr. Erkin's point about, you know, could we be leaving some of the thyroid in these patients is a good one. And, and we definitely do not have the answer to that question, but I suspect that we will have some sort of answer to that, or at least some trials coming out within the next five to 10 years that are looking specifically at that uh, point, maybe sooner. And, uh, and that's, I think, for me, what this article really draws in. Yes, I think it suggests that perhaps the radioactive iodine, um, you know, and, and the contralateral no, you know, lobe uh, removal are not, you know, are not having a significant effect in this low, these low-risk uh, patients who would be eligible for lobectomy. But again, the um, study population is different and these patients did have a higher burden of uh, metastatic nodes at initial presentation than at least I would feel comfortable uh, recommending just a lobectomy and nodal clearance for and leaving a contralateral lobe. You know, if a patient had five to 10, 11 metastatic nodes on presentation, I still would not feel comfortable. But if they had one, well, maybe that's another story. Um, and I think, that, you know, that's, that, that they would be my sort of concluding remarks, I think, on this article. Great. Um, thank you. I think that, um, you know, th things have really turned upside down in terms of how we think about this whole topic as uh, and, and this group of patients as we do less on the front end um, and have to manage them on the back end. And certainly having um, the ability to have such a, uh, um, even though the numbers seem relatively small, but um, to have the the length of follow-up that the um, Ito Hospital in Japan is able to afford us really provides us uh, some significant insight that I think um, would otherwise be difficult um, at many of our institutions in the U.S., notwithstanding perhaps the Mayo Clinic um, that has a very robust database. Um, but I think um, there are a number of unanswered questions, and I think one of the benefits of this article really is to make us rethink a lot about what we know um, and what we currently do, and um, in particular as it relates to low-risk thyroid cancer. And, and perhaps we may need to rethink our definition of, of this based on um, some of the some of the um, uh, lymph node parameters uh, that we've adopted and sort of taken into um, uh, and, and brought into our clinical practice. And so if there are, are not any additional questions that I see registered here, um, then by all means, um, I uh, hope everybody enjoys um, this long Memorial Day 
uh, weekend. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back again next Friday on a totally different topic and just um, related to uh, radiofrequency ablation for low-risk thyroid cancer, yet another um, twist in our current treatment paradigm. And I look forward to seeing you then. If anybody has any questions or comments, please reach out to us. And um, we continually try to upgrade our, our um, platform and uh, the way we're conducting this. And so we welcome your comments. Everybody stay safe and stay well. And thank you again.